Good morning. My name is Craig Domick, and I am the Dean of the MacArthur School of Leadership at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And it's my extreme pleasure to welcome you to the 20th anniversary ILA conference. We have been preparing for this for three and a half years. I got a phone call in February of 2015 from our Visitors and Convention Bureau saying, there's a, we want to put in a bid for the ILA conference in 2018. And I did, I had only been one in the tenure of my position for one month. And I did what any rookie leader would do, say, yes, of course. <laughs> I didn't even know what the ILA was exactly. But it had the magic word leadership. The mission of the MacArthur School of Leadership is transforming worlds by turning learners into leaders and I knew the ILA was where we wanted to be. So I shared this with our president and provost and they equally enthusiastically said, yes, let's jump in. And President Fleming has marshaled the resources of the whole university and made this a university priority and I thank him for that. It hasn't been just a uh, one school effort, it has been an entire campus being involved. In fact, by the way, if you would like to visit our beautiful campus, it's just two blocks east of here on your one mile walk or run to the Palm Beach Island and the ocean. So we are excited that you are here. You can imagine that a conference like this could not happen without a number of partnerships. And the first and foremost has been our wonderful relationship with the ILA leadership and staff. Cynthia, Bridget, Shelley, they've become friends and part of the family. And it's kind of interesting, you know, the ILA offices are in DC. They always come to visit us in the middle of winter. Other partnerships that we are experiencing, another evidence of that will be this Friday night. John and Gloria Borges, who head up the ILA's leadership and arts member group, has had a vision for doing a leadership arts event. Well, this Friday night at 8 o'clock in this very ballroom, there will be that leadership arts event as John directs the 72-piece Palm Beach Atlantic Orchestra in a leadership experience that you won't want to miss. There's still some tickets available and includes a, uh, a dessert buffet, and I'll guarantee you it'll, it'll grow your leadership. Also, we have tremendous partnership and support from our community. Throughout the day there are several panels that involve leaders in the community, leaders that are making a difference in our cities, in our region, leaders who are CEOs, former CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, and, uh, and we'll finish the day with uh, the CEO and Vice President of HR from the Breakers who will share how they have cultivated a leadership culture throughout their organization involving over a thousand people. And part of that partnership will be represented by the person I get to introduce next. And that is the mayor of West Palm Beach. Mayor Jerry has been a great friend to the university and uh, she's one of us. She has her doctorate in leadership, educational leadership. She's a leader in the area. In fact, she's one of a few urban mayors who is taking their city to get the designation of great places to work. And also she's co-hosting a conference in February that will be featuring John Cotter. So her heart is leadership. It bleeds like mine. So I'd like to now introduce our mayor, uh, a great friend of the university and a personal friend of mine, Dr. Jerry Moyo. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to our beautiful city of West Palm Beach. This is a little weird. You know, there's a monitor here, and I can see myself. It's, it's a little strange. Anyway, we're so happy to have the um, International Leadership Association here in our city. I want to congratulate Dean Craig Domek on his chair of this great uh, gathering today, and, of course, welcome you to our beautiful city. 
You know, West Palm Beach has a strong mayor form of government, which means that I am the CEO of the city. So when I was first elected, I was sort of sitting in my office thinking, what the heck does a CEO do? You know, I'm not in charge of anything really, but I'm really in charge of everything. But I soon uh, learned that my job was to be sure that those people who work for me and who work for the city have what they need to do their job. My job was also to develop leaders uh, within our organization. I learned that it is important to hire the right people and to give them the support they need to get the job done and encourage and support their growth. I also learned that I had to be clear about what that job was. I had to be clear about the, our vision for the city, had to be clear about our why. Our why is to serve the people of West Palm Beach um, while building a world-class city. John Maxwell says, a leader knows the way, shows the way, and goes the way. So that is why I come to work every day focused on how our West Palm Beach team can make our city a world-class city where people want to be where people want to live, work, and play. It is the driving force behind my desire to try new things and to push West Palm Beach, often excitedly, but sometimes kicking and screaming, in the direction of a modern, successful, and vibrant urban future. A future that puts people at the forefront of its design and mobility. A future of greater economic opportunity for all, a future that cherishes the diverse history, and a future that creates a sustainable and resilient West Palm Beach. I'm proud to say that our vision of a world-class city is becoming a reality. West Palm Beach has indeed made a name for itself, evolving into a city in the true sense of what a city is, a modern, created, creative, sophisticated urban engine that powers the region, a city where anyone hoping for a brighter future can find an opportunity and realize that future. West Palm Beach's economy is the strongest it's been since the economic downturn. In fact, our unemployment rate is at 3.6, down from about 10% when I first became mayor. A recent economic study noted that over the past few years, we have grown jobs by 20%. More, more than Miami has grown jobs, more than the state of Florida, and certainly more than the country. Our city's tax base has gone up consistently. We have grown almost 43% over the last four years to a $12.7 billion tax base. As a sign, of even more, as a sign that even more businesses are moving to West Palm Beach, our business tax receipts have gone up steadily. We have been able to accomplish all of this while clearly understanding that our role as our city government is to serve, to serve the community and the folks we represent, and to serve each other. So on that note, I welcome you to our city. I welcome you to this conference, and I hope that your stay will be enjoyable and fun time. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name's Audie Johnston, and I'm an associate professor of leadership at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And I'm a, I recently earned my PhD at Antioch University. Yay. <laughs> Over the past year, I've really had the honor of acting as the program co-chair with Shelley Spiller. And I wanted to thank the ILA as board members, its amazing staff that's put this on, Palm Beach Atlantic University, and of course the MacArthur School of Leadership for giving me this opportunity, which I consider was amazing to work with such great people. I have been asked to remind everyone that there is a new process, evaluation process, for the uh, conference sessions, for the pre-workshops and post-workshops, and you were given that information in your goodie bag. So please be sure to use that and evaluate the different sessions, because that gives us an opportunity to make it better next year. But that's not really why I'm up here. I have been given the additional honor, and I do mean honor, of introducing Katherine Tyler Scott. 
ILA board chair and managing partner of Kai Thought Bridge. It's a company that specializes in an integrated adaptive approach to leadership development through change management, conflict resolution, and negotiation skills. This organization's mission is the transformation of individuals, organizations, and communities. And I specifically like the communities because our communities are in dire need of people in leadership, positive leadership. However, when I tried to do my homework, I'm still trying to be a student, I knew that there was no way in the short period of time that I could serve justice and reflect on all of her accomplishments and what she's meant to the ILA. However, when I checked in the other day, she was standing beside me, and I did a bit of eavesdropping. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> she walked up, and you can see, and she expressed it, how concerned she was, how concerned she was with the way that our leadership was going in this country and around the world. And she made the statement of, when it was it okay to start having leaders who lie? When was it okay, and when was there the time that we turned that corner, and what were we going to do about it? She was talking to the young men at the desk, and their, their conversation continued on, but I thought, well, you probably shouldn't keep eavesdropping. That's not really very nice. So I walked away, but as I walked away, I reflected on what she said, and I think that when I look out into the audience here, we have leaders who are ready to take on the task of making a difference and doing things right a task that Catherine has put before her everything that she does and I think that she will continue to do. Catherine has a soul, a beautiful soul, a heart for leadership and a willingness to give back to, in a service to others. I'm going to quote her own words that I read, I am committed to the transformation of individuals, organizations and communities, once again to our communities that need it, through an integrated model of leadership development, change and conflict resolution. So please um, help me welcome Catherine. She's an amazing woman. She's an authentic leader. She has trust, resilience, grit, and grace. Catherine. Honestly, I am overwhelmed by that introduction. It was beautifully written. Thank you so much. Awesome Audie. On behalf of the board, it's my privilege to also welcome you to the 20th ILA Annual Conference. <laughs> when I was given this invitation to speak, and I said yes to our president and CEO, Cynthia Cherry. I immediately thought of the visual that she had several conferences ago. It may have been just last year. And so I asked to have it up during my remarks this morning. And you will see the visual on either side of me. I want you to hold that visual in your minds and in your hearts as I talk. I believe that leaders have an obligation to read reality truthfully in order to respond responsibly. And I also agree with those who say that an ongoing process of dedication to reality is essential to our mental health. And I think this requires at least two things which in combination are a moral imperative for leaders. They are, first of all, a wide span of awareness, and secondly, an attention to a larger context. Throughout history, there have always been times that demand awareness and the need for laser-like attention. This is one of those times. It is a time in which the pace and extent of change have intersected at a level of complexity that threatens our very capacity to comprehend, or to even know how to respond. Daily events are head spinning, frequently numbing, often disturbing, sometimes exhilarating, and all too often sobering. It can be overwhelming to absorb it all, and it is tempting to tune it all out. And there's so much going on in the world that what we pay attention to really does matter. What we pay attention to 
says something about who we are, what we believe, and what calls us to action. My reading of reality is that we are in a time of no longer and a time of not yet. We are in an in-between time that has left so many people untethered to the familiar, confused in the present, and unable to see the future. In this in-between time, fear has risen to debilitating levels. Intense emotions such as frustration and anger have escalated and are being manipulated for personal advantage and political gain. The increase in intolerance, incivility, and violence reflect a heightened state of systemic anxiety and emotional reactivity. Two of my colleagues this morning said, I think we have been gripped by the amygdala. We are witnessing signs of societal regression, a loss of ethical sensibilities, and an erosion of moral maturity. The deep fault lines of race, class, religion, and gender have resurfaced, and I think they reveal a lack of competence and confidence in our capacity to heal these divisions and focus on what brings us together. Democracy is under serious attack, and an idolatry of autocratic, authoritarian forms of governance threaten to eradicate the very founding principles of our countries. Those in the highest positions of authority and power are characterizing themselves as victims, and they use this nomenclature as justification for the victimization of others, for their oppressive policies and escalation of verbal assaults and an advocacy of physical attack. There has never been a more critical time for leadership, and never have we needed ILA more. Our core values of inclusion, impact, integrity, interconnection, interdisciplinary approaches, and international perspectives are bold and courageous statements of deeply embedded beliefs. They are touchstones for what it means to lead in an in-between time a framework for our vision, a mission, and hope for a better world. They are the positive force in a time that is antithetical to such values, and they remind us that leadership is not value neutral. It is value laden. We express these values in several ways, all the ways that you are familiar with, our global and regional conferences, member groups, webinars, ILA intersections, and numerous publications. We are committed to providing opportunities in which we can step back from myopic busyness of day-to-day -day tasks long enough to read reality truthfully and to figure out whether and how we can respond responsibly. The space of ILA, the space that it aspires to, provide for all of us is the nexus of a global network. We are all part of that network, and the nexus is a space we claim for intellectual respite and thoughtful reflection, a space in which we can exchange ideas, challenge our assumptions, examine our biases and prejudices, and clear pathways for achieving mutual understanding and respect for the contributions that each of us bring. The nexus is the space where civil discourse and dialogue are the norm, where the fears and anxieties that threaten to overturn reason can be heard and explored, where we take responsibility for ourselves and for our actions. ILA aspires for this space to be a place where facts matter, truth has meaning, and the pursuit of both are prized. So an attribute of this space that merits special attention is that of living the question, a phrase inspired by letters to a young poet, by Rainier Ramirez Wilkie. 
and I just want to read it to you. I read it often. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart, he writes, and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign language. Do not seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. To live the question is to open up the space and arrange for everyone to join the conversation. Living the question helps us to think more deeply, to pay closer attention, to see the patterns that lead not only to knowledge, but to mutual understanding. An English writer, Aldous Huxley, said, to know is passive. To understand is to be able to act on one's knowledge. In the mid-1960s, during a period of racial animosity and violence, religious intolerance, anti-immigration sentiment, growing economic disparity, and entrenched class division, much like we are seeing across our globe today, Warren Bennis, leadership educator, scholar, and the 2010 ILA Lifetime Achievement Awardee asked the question, where have all the leaders gone? This question led him to a lifelong search for answers and significant contributions not only to ILA but to the field of leadership. The founders of our organization also asked a question. What do we need to strengthen and advance the research, study, and practice in the field of leadership? This question was posed in an era when different sectors and disciplines were more competitive than collaborative. They were siloed and separated, and few cross-disciplinary initiatives existed. Even within many universities, schools and departments did not work together, and the notion of practitioners being included as valued peers was not something the academy even entertained. But the founders of ILA boldly set aside this history of specialization, turf building, rigid boundary setting, and divisions between professional disciplines and sectors. They presciently formed a space in which research, teaching, and practice connected for the greater good so living the question led them to see the need for intersectionality in leadership, study, and practice. They knew to avoid the situation in which experts address larger and larger problems with smaller and smaller lenses. This always leads to the extinction of a discipline. Jean Lipman Blumen, noted scholar and practitioner author and also a recipient of the ILA Lifetime Achievement Award, asked a question, leadership for what, several conferences ago? Well, ILA is living this question and is more intentional about the what. Our mission to advance leadership knowledge and practice for a better world positions us to respond responsibly to emerging and ever-changing realities. Our mission leaves space for the unexpected and the innovative, for the development and practice of self-differentiated leadership, and for the development of skills to manage the tension in a time of no longer, in a time of not yet. The nexus of ILA is a center for inquiry, the space in which the struggle to come to a fuller sense of the truth is continual. The space where the greatest potential resides for answering that question, leadership for what? It is a global laboratory for creative thoughts and innovative outcomes, a place of synthesis, a space where the study, teaching, and practice of leadership converges for a future we may not see and for those we may never know. It is a space of uncompromised intellectual rigor, scholarship, and best practice. 
It must work to become a culture that supports the development of the emotional and psychological maturity of leaders. This is inner work. And when we don't do it, we risk perpetuating the very systems that create the problems I listed earlier. Action without this depth of awareness inevitably leads to harm. Edwin Friedman writes about the critical importance of this type of leadership development in his book, A Failure of Nerve. On the broadest scale, the preservation of self in its leaders is society's greatest protection against descending into a counter-evolutionary mode. It is only the emergence of self in its leadership that can enable society, family, institutions, or even nations to evolve out of a regression. This underscores the message that our current thinking and pedagogies must undergo extensive re-examination. How are we contributing to the field in ways that protect societies from descending into this counter-evolutionary mode? Are we expanding the space of inquiry, probing more deeply, and including more diversity of thought and perspective? Our founders recognized, as the researchers Robert and Michelle Root Bernstein discovered, that no major problem facing the world today can be boxed neatly within a single discipline or approached effectively by analysis, emotion, or tradition alone. The future will depend upon our ability to integrate all ways of knowing and all kinds of people because the problems and issues humanity is facing will need creative solutions from many fields, solutions that are transdisciplinary and multimodal. We are an interconnected network that comes together at a center point, the nexus, the space of the integration of all ways of knowing and of this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. Out of the nexus, new questions will be formed, creating those dynamic collaborations and the generative connections between practitioners, educators, and researchers that will enrich the special space of ILA and strengthen the field of leadership. You, all of you, are the heart of ILA, and through your engagement and commitment, ILA will continue to become more of itself, congruent in the application of all of its core values. It will be a powerful, bold, and reasoned voice of authenticity and integrity in a time of mistruths and incivility. It will be a hospitable space for disciplined reflection in a harried world often unwilling to live along some distant day into the answers. The 20th ILA conference is our opportunity to meet as a community of learning in which we will form new cross-disciplinary relationships, strengthen existing ones, and experience this space of information, innovation, formation, and yes, transformation as preparation for reading reality truthfully and responding with courageous action. You are the leaders who will live the new questions that will help to achieve the ILA mission to advance leadership, knowledge, and practice for a better world. So welcome to your space, ILA space. Welcome to Leadership at the Nexus. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning. I'm Cynthia Cherry, President of the International Leadership Association, and I have the distinct pleasure of first 
thanking Craig and Mayor Muyo and Audie for welcoming us to this beautiful place, this place for us to engage in deeper conversation. And Catherine, thank you for setting the stage for this conference for us. Um, I'd love to give another round of applause to all of them. As an FYI for everybody, we are live streaming the three plenaries, um, so smile if, right? Um, I now have the distinct pleasure of honoring one of our luminaries in the field. Now, the ILA, the Leadership Legacy Program, is one of the ways that the ILA celebrates those who have contributed significantly to the field of leadership. These scholars and thought leaders have made noteworthy contributions to the study and practice of leadership. Their accomplishments include prominent published works and influential support of a body of knowledge and practice, resulting in very significant contributions to the field itself. At the 2008 conference, we honored the inaugural class of six individuals with the ILA Lifetime Achievement Award. Those recipients included Bernie Bass, Warren Bennis, James McGregor Burns, Francis Hesselbein, Manfred Katz de Vries, and Joe Rost. Since then, we have honored 28 more individuals with the Lifetime Achievement Award. All are honored at a global conference and are on the ILA Virtual Hall of Fame on the website. At the Barcelona conference, we had the distinct pleasure of recognizing three individuals that I just want to share with you. One was Boa Shamir, but the other two were also our founding mothers, Georgia Sorensen and Lorraine Matusak. In 2016, it was our pleasure to honor Gil Hickman and Barbara Kellerman. In Brussels, we honored Stella Nakomo from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, and Bob Lord from the United Kingdom. Today, it is our distinct pleasure to honor Keith Grint. Keith, would you please join me on the stage along with Brad Jackson, who is a former ILA board member. Thank you, Cynthia. It is indeed a great honor to be invited to honor Professor Keith Grint on behalf of all of his colleagues throughout the world. Among the pantheon of outstanding professors of leadership that the ILA has honored, it is Keith who has influenced my thinking and practice about leadership most substantially and most powerfully. And I know I'm not alone in this sentiment. Keith Grint is Professor of Public Leadership at Warwick University in Coventry in the Midlands of England. He's also a Fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences and he's only just recently retired. Before becoming an academic, Keith spent 10 years as a blue collar worker and held a number of jobs including postman, freezer operative and karate instructor you have been warned. <laughs> this background and perspective has grounded his teaching and his scholarship at the nexus of leadership theory and practice. This is a, uh, a nexus that you so eloquently uh, reminded of us, Catherine. As a founding co-editor of Leadership, an academic journal published by SAGE, and as co-founder of the International Studying Leadership Conference, Keith has played a vitally important role in the development of the field by building a very strong community of leadership researchers who take critical yet constructive approaches to leadership very seriously. A prolific writer, Keith has penned more than 90 journal articles and book chapters, and he's written or edited a number of landmark leadership books, including The Sage Handbook of Leadership and Leadership, A Very Short Introduction 
And let me tell you, uh, whenever an article comes out with Keith's name, uh, you have to read it. It's always very distinctive and always very illuminating. His recent research includes work on mindfulness in high reliability organizations and leadership romanticism. Uh, this sounds like it's going to be a very lively retirement, Keith. <laughs> Keith, as you'll see, is a terrific presenter. His keynote remarks for the ILA conference in London and for the topical ILA conference in The Hague and many others have always been extremely well received. You certainly won't want to miss his invited presentation on the topic of leadership and dissent at the concurrent session time following this plenary. Cynthia. So Keith, on behalf of the ILA and the Legacy Committee, it is our honor to induct you into the ILA Hall of Fame as a luminary of the leadership field with the ILA Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Brad and to David Conson and uh, Cynthia and all the other ILA people that have made this uh, happen. I think the only reason I've got it is that the only way to stop me from teaching people is to make me take one of these awards. Uh, Cynthia said I have uh, about 35 minutes to speak. So I've done a very short presentation. Uh, what, I, what I really want to talk about <laughs> is not that. I, I just want to spend uh, two and a half minutes talking about uh, the enemy of the people. Uh, I want to use Ibsen's play called The Enemy of the People as a way of thinking about leadership. So if you don't know the play, first of all, you should read it. Uh, and secondly, the play is about a Norwegian coastal town it's a tourist area, and the town have invested heavily in the public baths for the upcoming tourist season. And on the first day of the tourist season, uh, the local doctor, Dr. Stockman, realizes that the baths have been poisoned by the local tannery. So he goes to the mayor, who happens to be his brother, and tells the mayor that they have to close the baths down, otherwise we'll endanger the public. And the mayor says, I don't think so, not after all that investment. And despite his logical and rational argument with his brother, Dr. Stockman fails. So he decides to call a public meeting of the town, knowing that the public will take their responsibility very seriously and close the baths. So he calls a public meeting, and the public howl him down and call him the enemy of the people. There is something in this I want you to think about in terms of leadership not being about heroism, not being about leading people over the top to a glorious future, but about telling people important truths that they don't want to listen to. So the enemy of the people is, of course, a phrase that President Trump has used for attacking the media in this country. And it's used, ironically, by the media against uh, senior high court judges in the UK uh, for trying to assume that the politicians should also be subject to the law. So it has a very common uh, usage around the world. In fact, the first time the enemy of the people phrase was used by, was by the French revolutionaries, the Jacobin, uh, who organized a law in 1794, which basically said anybody who dissented from the revolution would be executed. So that phrase has a very interesting and terrible tenor. It was also used, again ironically, by Khrushchev in 1956, when Khrushchev denounces Stalin and Lenin for using the phrase, the enemy of the people, as a way of crushing dissent. So I want you to worry about this in terms of the how that phrase operates. And I want you to think instead of a German scholar called Enzensberger, who wrote a paper a few years ago. And the paper is called 
something like Leadership, The Heroes of Retreat. It's in a book called Zigzag. Heroes of Retreat, Enzenberger argues, is for us to rethink the importance of leadership in times of crisis like we have today. And he uses it as a way of thinking about retreat, as many people will know, is the hardest option in a military campaign. And Enzenberger argues that the really important leadership phrase that we can use is to think about how we can lead people into a retreat, not into an advancement, not to a utopia, but to get people to recognize that the thing that they wanted is not achievable. And sometimes you have to tell people things that they don't want to listen to. So he uses this, and there's lots of examples in the paper. He's, for example, he talks about uh, the removal of apartheid in South Africa. And conventionally, we talk about that in terms of Mandela and being the hero. But Enzensberger also argues we should think about the role of F.W. de Klerk in being the hero of retreat, in being the person that told the white population, the game is up, we cannot continue like this, otherwise there will be civil war. So what F.W. de Klerk did is sacrifice himself for the greater good. And I think Enzenberger is right. There are lots of political leaders that don't take their responsibilities seriously enough in trying to tell their population, their followers, that what you think you are going to achieve is not achievable. And I shall just finish this with a quote, my favorite quote from Ronnie Heifetz, who argues that leadership is about disappointing people at a rate they can manage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, please, can I ask you to honor Professor Keith Grint, who cer most certainly didn't disappoint. So uh, thank you so much indeed. We're very proud. Thank you, Keith. Don't keep doing that or I'll start singing. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that means an encore, Keith. <laughs> Can I call upon Shelley Spiller? Kia ora. Warm greetings. Um, my name is Shelley Spiller and it's been a pleasure to serve as a co-chair of programs with Audi and to work alongside the incredible ILA team of people who are really dedicated, professional and organized, who've worked so hard to bring this conference into being. Our call for papers asked how authentic leadership can create a future that embraces progress, fosters peace and creates prosperity for the greater good of the global community. And our speaker, Professor Donna Ladkin, has amassed a body of work that helps us as scholars and practitioners to bring leadership into being in a way that uplifts our spirit and connects us meaningfully to each other, our communities and our ecologies. Donna, who is with Antioch University, is an internationally recognized leadership and ethics scholar, educator and practitioner. She has an extraordinary gift for taking complex philosophy and making it relatable, accessible, and practical. Like many of the philosophers that she draws upon, Donna herself disrupts taken for granted assumptions to open up new vistas. She encourages us to let poetry, art, music, and movement to flow through us to ignite other ways of knowing. Donna is unafraid to dive deep into complexity, ambiguity, into tangled contradictions and subtle nuances. Something I really admire about Donna is her groundedness. She's a qualified yoga instructor, a trained body-based therapist, a lover of nature, a warm, open-hearted trailblazer. 
She cares deeply about humanity's contribution to making this world a better place. Her dauntless com commitment embodies a fierce grace and a deep wisdom. And it's a pleasure as a friend and as a colleague to welcome you to the stage, Donna. Please join me in welcoming Donna. Well, it's a real delight and a privilege to be here with you this morning. And Shelley, thank you so much for that very touching introduction. I must acknowledge as I start this talk this morning that many of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you are actually the result of our conversations, my conversations with Shelley over the last eight years. Um, so actually, this is kind of from both of us, I feel, the, the talk this morning. So I've been thinking really hard about this topic, the theme of this conference today, authentic leadership for prosperity and peace and progress. And the thing about it is, in that very phrase itself, I find a little contradiction. And really, the talk that I'm going to give focuses on that contradiction. And that contradiction is the disparity between authenticity as it seems to often be theorized, as we seem to talk about it as leadership scholars, not all of us, but many of us talk about authenticity as a kind of unmediated way of presenting oneself in the world, an unfiltered way of presenting oneself in the world. And when I think about that in my own case, I sort of think, well, actually, sometimes my unmediated, unfiltered way of being in the world doesn't really promote peace <laughs> or prosperity or progress. Sometimes that unmediated, unfiltered self is quite mean. You know, sometimes that unmediated self is quite selfish. And so I, I kind of have a problem with this when we think about the notion of being authentic and then aligning it to things like peace and prosperity. Well, wh what does that actually mean? So that's one of the contradictions, one of the little paradoxes I'll be talking about this morning. I need to lay my cards on the table in terms of this talk and where I'm coming from. For those of you who know my work, uh, one of my big projects has been to try to decenter the leader in leadership. So I've been much more interested in how leadership might be collectively, relationally understood and experienced. Yeah. So the leader is important, but I see the leader as taking up a role. So it's not so much about you, the leader, the person, but it's about you when you step into the space of leading others. Yeah, so, and I'll be unpacking that a little bit more as well, what I mean by leadership as a role or leading as a role that we take up. And the final bit of framing I'd like to give you before we get into the main body of the talk is very much when, when Catherine gave the Rilke quote this morning, the quote about questions. That's, one, that's also one of my favorite quotes. I, I love that quote, and it speaks to one of my concerns as well, which is about questions. And so this is a very strange experience for me in some ways, because this is probably the largest group I've ever addressed, and yet I actually feel like what I'm going to share with you is quite intimate. It's kind of some of my inner struggles and the dilemmas that I'm having with this notion of authentic leadership and what that means. Because there's something at the heart of it that I do feel is important. You know, we want to know that the leaders that we follow or those people taking up leadership roles that we're following, we want to know that they're in some way trustworthy, that we can rely on them in certain ways. And I think that is something about what we're yearning for in terms of authenticity. But at the same time, it's 
how does that actually work within the role constraints of being a leader, which often requires people to do things that don't speak to this notion of the true self. So that's, I've always, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is. So in many ways, this feels like kind of opening up some of the questions that I'm still grappling with rather than giving you answers. This is not a talk about giving answers. It's about kind of trying to open up that space and to invite you to kind of tease through some of these questions that are so important. Okay, so that's by way of framing what we're going to be looking at over the next 30 minutes. The roadmap, we've got uh, three points to this roadmap. I'm first going to do a very short critique of mainstream authentic leadership theorizing. Many people have done this before me, but I'm just going to pick up a couple of points that I'd like to challenge. Um, secondly, I'd like to unpack this notion of leading as a role. And particularly, what does this mean in relation to the concept of authenticity? And finally, I'd like to introduce a concept of s the concept of self-constitution. I'll be unpacking that and explaining what I mean by that. But for me, maybe it provides a bridge between thinking about the role constraints of leading and this notion of authenticity. So that's where we're going. So first of all, just to talk about authentic leadership theories. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is these pictures, a lot of them I'll be using, these paintings, there are the, uh, I don't know if you recognize this, this is Mark Rothko's work, an American expressionist painter. Um, I love his work because I find that as I look into these pictures, the more I look into them, the more I see, the more I see something about myself, the more I see something about the painter, maybe something about the context within which he was painting. So I invite you to dwell in these paintings as we kind of talk through these concepts. So first of all, to think about authentic leadership theorizing, and I'm going to just pull up two points that I think are particularly challenging. And the first concerns, well, first of all, is just to say what theory of authentic leadership I'm actually drawing from in terms of critiquing. And it is, of course, uh, Ovolio Gardner, Wernsing, Peterson, and uh, Fred Willemba's work on authentic leadership. They've done the seminal work in this area in various combinations, but in particular, I'm drawing on their paper in which they introduce their four factors which go into authentic leadership. Uh, self-awareness, relational transparency, balanced processing, and finally having a moral compass. So, and, and they've done all the work to devise their authentic leadership questionnaire, which I'm sure many of you know and use with your, because I know there are a lot of leadership developers in the room, so I know that you're probably very familiar with this. And this is the kind of seminal theory that I'm critiquing. And as I said, many people have critiqued this theory as well. And so the first kind of issue is in terms of how we constitute the self, how we actually think about the self. Now, in that theory that Gardner et al. are working with, they refer to two psychologists' work, two American psychologists' work, in terms of their development of their theory. Um, and very interesting in their theory is they're really drawing from a very individualized notion of the self, which is something that's inner, quite unimodal, quite unchanging, yeah? Now, what I'd like to say is, this is just one way of thinking about the self. Just one way. The question of the self and who we are has been at the heart of philosophical inquiry ever since human beings have been wondering these kinds of questions. And there are many different ways of thinking about the nature of the self that don't actually talk about this kind of inner journey. For instance, the existentialists who were working at the turn of the century, the, the turn of the, into the 1900s, they actually had a different conceptualization of the self. They thought that the self was something that we created. And for them, it was essential that we try to be free and that the the journey toward freedom was a way of developing the self. So they had a very different conception of what the self is, yeah? So I'd just like to say that 
the theory of the self that is being used in a lot of traditional authentic leadership theorizing is not the only one. And it can be quite interesting to think about how are other people thinking about the self. And in some ways, how might other models of the self better fit the needs of leading? And this brings me to the second question, the second challenge. And that is, what is or who is this authenticity for? Yeah? So again, to lay my cards on the table, I am not a Trump supporter. Um, however, I think it's a real challenge to those of us who are not Trump supporters to try to question what is going on particularly in the relationship between Trump and his followers, many of whom champion President Trump for his authenticity. Now, in my view, the kind of authenticity which Mr. Trump is representing is that kind of unmediated, unfiltered kind of authenticity, that way of thinking about it. So, I can understand there's a kind of pull toward that because there's something like, it, you know, whatever he thinks comes out of his mouth, <laughs> you know. And I can understand that that might be quite attractive, particularly within, an, within a political context, within so much that leaders, political leaders, give us has been, you know, produced through many times round focus groups, you know. So, Actually, it's interesting to me to think about, well, what is going on here? And I think that this is a really important question that we need to be asking. And what kind of authenticity that Mr. Trump represents, what is that doing for those people who do support him? And, you know, that's an important question to be asking. What is this about? Now, in my view, the kind of authenticity that is required within a role such as that of the President of the United States actually does require a kind of mediated response because you hold so much power when you're in this role. So actually it can be quite important <laughs> to filter <laughs> what it is that you're doing. And in fact, for most of us when we take up leading roles, it's really important that we do mediate what we say and what we do. And in fact, the leading role requires that of us. We need to often draw on a part of ourselves that may not be our true self in that moment. I don't know. Whenever I come to a dilemma and I think, oh, I want to you know, think about what my inner self wants to do, when I look inside, what I experience is many selves. <laughs> I experience many kind of competing selves vying for what's the most important thing to do in this situation. And as I said at the opening, not all of them are all that progressive. Yeah? So maybe it's a question of, in this role, where do I need to look in terms of which self I'm going to draw from in this moment? What purpose is, am I trying to serve and which self will best support that purpose. So what I'd like to do is now think about this notion of leading as a role, right? And that is the idea that when we take up the responsibility of being a leader, taking up that role, what does it mean? What does it require of us? I mean, one of the things I think it requires is a huge amount of generosity a huge amount of thinking beyond the self, beyond what my inner self might be wanting, to thinking, what are the needs of my followers? What are the needs of this moment in this time? So I'd like to give you an example of this. It's drawn from a film that I love, Apollo 13. I don't know how many people of you know this film. But it's a representation of the Apollo mission to the moon, which went badly wrong. There was a, a misfunction uh, in the spaceship, and the leader back at NASA 
uh, has to organize the team in such a way that they're able to get the three astronauts back down to Earth. And I'm going to be showing a clip which is at the end of the film, and it's at the point when they're waiting for the spacecraft to make it through the Earth's atmosphere, and they're going to find out whether or not the astronauts are safe. And what I'd like you to pay attention to is at the very end of this clip that I'm going to show you. And I'd like you to notice uh, it's Ed Harris, is the actor who's playing this part. And I think just at the end, if you watch his expression, and I think as you watch his expression, for me, what he does actually signifies something. What he's telling us is the cost of taking up the leader role, particularly in such a stressful situation. So Wayne, if you could just run the video now, that'd be great. One minute and 30 seconds to end of blackout. No re-entering ship has ever taken longer than three minutes to emerge from blackout. This is the critical moment for the heat shield hold the command module survive the intense heat of re-entry. If it doesn't, there will only be silence. Mommy, you're squishing me. I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay, flight, that's three minutes. We are standing by for acquisition. Copy that. Odyssey, Houston, do you read me? Odyssey, this is Houston, do you read? The expected time of reacquisition, the time when the astronauts were expected to come out of blackout, has come and gone. But all any of us can do now is just listen and hope. We're about to learn whether or not that heat shield, which was damaged, as you remember, by the explosion three days ago, has withstood the inferno of re-entry. Odyssey, this is Houston. Do you read me? Odyssey, Houston, do you read me? Three minutes, 30 seconds, stand by. Odyssey, Four minutes, standing by. Odyssey, uh, Houston, do you read? That's it. <laughs> he's not celebrating, yeah? Because he's actually been holding this, yeah? He's not been able to freak out <laughs> and say, oh my gosh, what's going on? He's had to hold this situation. Yeah, that's the purpose that he's been serving, yeah? And that's why if we just rely on being true to that true self, if that true self is saying, ah, <laughs> you know, that's not really effective in terms of leading. Um, I've been working with another colleague of mine, Stephen Taylor, over the years to look at this notion of at the same time that you're holding a role, we do also know that there are more and less authentic role performances. Yeah? So 
Ed Harris there is acting that role. Now, I find it quite authentic how he's, but he's still an actor, yeah? And people who are taking up the leader role, maybe they're not acting in that kind of sense, but how is it that they might be able to convey a sense of authenticity? And we actually looked at uh, authenticity as an embodied phenomena, and we were looking at uh, three different factors that were involved. The first is self-exposure, that actually, if we're going to be read as authentic, we have to, in some way, be showing something of ourselves, yeah? Something of whatever self we're deciding to show in that space. But actually, this is relationally based, that it's not just about me just emoting, but I need to be doing it in such a way that I make a connection with others. So authenticity that's just based on, this is what's really going on for me, and I don't really care if that's going to land anywhere. Yeah, that's not very helpful, especially within the leadership space. And in the leadership space as well, we need to be making choices that people will read as leaderly. Yeah? So it does require us to make some choices, to be discerning about what purpose we're trying to serve in a particular space. Now, all of this doesn't just come naturally, yeah? All of this needs to be developed. The capacity to work with this needs to be developed. It's not something that we just wake up and can do. And I'd like to turn now to this concept of self-constitution as a way of thinking about a deliberate way in which we can foster these capacities of relational authenticity in which we are making good discerning choices. Um, important to this notion of self-constitution is that it is uh, done in relation. There's a whole school of psychology that suggests, suggests that we actually only know ourselves through our relationships with others. So this is so important. It's not necessarily this deep dive. It's actually a way of bringing ourselves into relation with others. And here, instead of kind of referring to a kind of unimodal self which is unique and individual and individualized, what I'd like to return to, and I'm so glad that Audie mentioned the word soul this morning. It's not a word that we often talk about in this kind of fora, but I'd like to return to a notion of self as relation as related to the concept of soul. And here, I'd like to refer to the Neoplatonic way of thinking about the soul. And I'm drawing from Ficino's work. Ficino was a philosopher at the turn of the 15th century, and he's noted for, he had the great task. He translated all of Plato's work into Latin. So he, uh, <laughs> he really thought about this stuff. And he wrote that the soul, like the self, is undefinable. Right? I think that's really important. But its provenance is the universe. It is the bond between all things. Ficino also had a very interesting uh, way of thinking about the way in which the individual spirit or spark of a self, because he did recognize that each of us is imbued with a particular way of being in the world. Yeah, we, we, we do have that particular way of being in the world, but that it relates to this larger understanding of the soul of the world. world. Yeah? So he doesn't say that we don't have an individual voice. We do, and he talks about the diamond, that kind of individual spark but it's about how we develop that diamond in relation to the world, which is so important. I think that's a really important understanding of thinking about how authenticity might work in this case. The practices of self-constitution here, and he, from here I'm drawing from the work of the French philosopher Michel Foucault, who writes about self-constitution as a way of developing the ethical self the ethical subject, the subject that can make discerning choices about what it is to be good in the world. And here, there are uh, three practices I'd just like to offer you as a starting point 
for thinking about self-constitution. The first is the self-reflection and critique. Yeah. Um, Foucault writes about, he, he does a lot of, as you know, Foucault does a lot of archaeology into looking at how the Greeks and Stoics before him thought about these practices. And he, he does a whole book where he's looking at the letters of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. And it's really interesting to read the letters of Marcus Aurelius, to read the writing, the self-critique of Marcus Aurelius. Because what he's writing about in those letters, he's writing about the minutia of his daily practice. He's writing about what he eats. He's writing about the conversations that he has with the people around him. He's writing, and he's being critical in, those, in that way of writing. He's actually thinking, whose purpose am I serving here? What am I trying to do here? Am I doing, is my behavior actually matching up with what I aspire to? What Foucault suggests as a, as a key self-practice is the practice of writing. Now, very few of us write longhand anymore, yeah but that practice of actually writing a bit each day to review what one is doing. It's embarrassing to do it sometime. I, I've kept a journal since I was 16, and I'm in the process of moving house at the moment. And one of the big questions is, what do we do with the piles of journals that I've you know, established over the years? And I've been looking at them, and I've been reading my 21-year-old self, and my 23-year-old self, and my 30-year-old self, and as it goes, and it's, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> Shocking, actually. But it's also really humbling. And it's also really interesting, because it makes me think about the different contexts in which I have operated, and how I have made certain choices. And having that kind of self-reflective process is a way of keeping oneself honest, actually having a way of being accountable to the self. I mentioned uh, the notion of context. This is a second key practice of self-constitution. It's about actively interrogating the context within which one is operating. And that's not just at the little level, you know, my family, my business, my organization, but it's also my community, my world. What is it that my world needs from me that may be different from what I think I need for myself right now? It's really interesting as well to notice how context changes, and this is one of the things that, you know, we need to be taken out of ourselves sometimes to notice the kind of constraints that we're operating within from particular context. Again, I was, I was I've just recently returned to the United States after having lived in the UK for 35 years, and it's very interesting for me coming back to American culture and, and kind of noticing American culture for the first time, ha you know, not having lived here for that long. And I went to the Portland Symphony Orchestra last week, and I was quite shocked because at the beginning of the performance, the orchestra played the Star Spangled Banner. And it was really interesting. Why was this happening? What is this about? Um, and what I would have liked to have done in that space, I would have liked to have remained sat. But actually, everybody around me stood up. And it was really interesting, because authentically, I didn't feel it was appropriate to stand up, and yet I did. Um, and I think that says something about context, the context that we put ourselves into, how that context informs what we do. And it's something about recognizing that. And then the third practice is about working to the edge, actually finding those cracks those ways of working within that context that actually may speak more real, in a more real way, to what one's response is in that moment. I think this is the real hard work of leading, particularly in a context that we're living in at the moment. How do we work to the edges of ourselves rather than kind of 
just centralizing into our notion, our safe notion of who we are and what we stand for and what we value, all of which can be really important. But I think it's really important to ask ourselves the question, is that, is that hold that we have on ourselves and that way that we know ourselves to be, is that really what the moment that we're living in is calling for? How might we work to the edge? How might we find a real part of ourselves that can work to the edge of ourselves in such a way that we're more responsive to something bigger than ourselves, something bigger than that kind of un that unimodal notion of my true self? How might we do that? When I in you know, when I was reflecting on my experience in Portland, it made me think about the football players who are taking a knee. And it, I understood that in a completely different way because, oh my gosh, the pressure to conform is huge. But to find a way to work that edge where you're finding a nonviolent way of expressing something that's real for you in this particular context, you know, that's magic. How do we find those spaces? So those are the questions that I'm grappling with. Um, those are my dilemmas that I offer you. I said I wouldn't be giving you answers, but I couldn't help but try and find some way of summarizing um, where I find myself. So thinking about this version of authenticity, another version of authenticity which, which might better respond to the needs of this moment, maybe we could base it in a notion of relationality, of resonance with, rather than just acting on me. Maybe it could work to the edges of our possible selves rather than just centralizing down into what we know, into our habits of being ourselves. And finally, this last point, I know I'm a very earnest person. <laughs> I want to do good in the world. This is important to me. But I also realize that I need to temper that. I need to temper that with the willingness to step out of myself, to laugh at myself, to be curious, to be playful. I think these are all things that we need to do. We need to loosen up a bit as well if we're really going to find ways of responding helpfully to this present moment. And I'd like to just end uh, with Michel Foucault, a little quote from him which I, which I really like. Foucault, he, he, he never wanted to be categorized. You know, people would say he's a post-structuralist. He'd say, I'm not a post-structuralist. I mean, he never liked to fit into categories. And he, he said, it's really not so important to know what I am. The interesting thing in life and work is to become something more than I was at the beginning. And I think that actually if we're going to find a way of, an, of embodying a, a version of authenticity which really brings us to peace and progress and prosperity, not just for ourselves, but for the greater good, that thinking about what we want to be rather than what we are might be a good starting point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for opening the conference so boldly, so beautifully, and I'm not sure about you, but I feel tempted to go to the edge and practice on you all during the next few days, so watch out. Um, but really, you know, really um, an opportunity for us to really play with, you know, play with this and loosen up and lighten up and, and enjoy our time together. Uh, it's my great honor to present you now with a Globe Award. Um, on behalf of us all. So excuse me while I duck down and get that. Not 
not sure if you can see this. I'll try and pull it out. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Do this without yeah. dropping it. <laughs> so, on behalf of us all, Donna, present you with this glow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Um. <laughs> Thank you. And just a reminder that it's now a tea and coffee break and the sessions will start promptly at 10.45. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.